we'll start with a small um, prayer from Bhartri Hari. Yeah. All right. Do you know what it means? What do you know what it means? What, what you just now say? Do you know? Do you know? No, no, no. We know, we know, we know. You know, do you know, Sarika? Shiyante Kalu Bhushanani Satatam. All the ornaments, well, this thing, uh, get old and, and get uh, uh, decay. Vag Bhushanam Bhushanam, the one that does not, the real ornament is speech. It would be good if you learn that, Jacob. Speech. That does not mean go and give speeches to your students, you do, but through it in such a way, ya samskrita dharete, it's a great culture and so on and so forth. So when you speak, speak well. That was actually meant for you. Your reputation has preceded you, Jacob. I try my best. <laughs> you must learn to talk well. People who don't know you say this. <laughs> oh. If I were you, my day would begin very badly. <laughs> well, it's it's looking that way right now. So. <laughs> <laughs> it's a beautiful choice. Beautiful choice. Okay. Okay. I leave you guys to continue and uh, take yes. the word when it. Yes. Uh, thank you, Professor Balu. Uh, so I. So I see about 220 attendees now. I think uh, we can uh, uh, get started. I hope the rest of the 300, uh, 220 of them will join soon. Uh, I am Srinivas. Um, I am from Indic Academy. I'm a volunteer at Indic Academy. Uh, we welcome all of you. We welcome the panelist, uh, panelists to this uh, great event. So we have uh, the Bahubali among the thinkers of contemporary world, uh, Professor uh, Balagangadara here with us and his very illustrious students who are professors, thinkers, and researchers who are doing exemplary work across the world uh, in various centers that have been established to pursue the research program established by Professor Balagangadara about four decades ago. Um, so this, I have already communicated the format uh, for this event. Uh, we'll have three sessions with uh, half an hour breaks. So the first session uh, will be 12.30 to uh, 1.30 uh, is the panel discussion and then about half an hour of uh, Q&A. Uh, all uh, attendees, you can see there's a Q&A option at the bottom center of your screen. Uh, you can click that and please type your questions uh, there. Um, of course, you can use the chat window to pass on comments of any sort, but if you want to ask questions for the Q&A session, please use the Q&A module, the option which you see at the bottom center of the screen. I now invite uh, Sri Harikiran Vadlamani, founder of Indic Academy, to introduce and say a few words, and then we can get started. Thank you. Uh, Arden, I think Janet Arden uh, of New Zealand Prime Minister uh, spoke about her achievements of the government for in two minutes she gave a, and that went viral. Uh, so Indic Academy just completed five minutes, five, five years, and I've got five minutes to talk about it. So I'm going to talk very rapidly. I'm just going to stay my, uh, share my screen and hopefully we'll cover something for you to get a sense of. Okay, so Indic Academy is um, a non-traditional university for traditional knowledge. Our purpose is to bring about a global Indic renaissance that is based on Indic and indigenous knowledge systems. We pursue a multi-dimensional strategy, a strategy that seeks to build centers of excellence, seeks to transform intellectuals and build an ecosystem. 
we all think about a strategy on three dimensions. I think about I'm living in a cube in these three dimensions, wherein we to seek to preserve, protect, and promote our indigenous knowledge systems. We took our thinking is near term, medium term, and long term. And we look at the dimensions of intellectual, cultural, and spiritual. That's the broader framework. Insofar as centers of excellence are concerned, we have set up three centers of, of excellence. One is an intergurukula university center. We have heard of inter-university centers. This is the intergurukula university center, wherein we are bringing about and building a bridge between four components, which is the traditional Shastric study, Indic knowledge systems, Indology, and fusing the Western and Eastern uh, the knowledge systems so that it is on a civilization basis. So that is our ambition. We have um, acquired land in Hyderabad and we are seeking to build a multidisciplinary Gurukul along with this inter-university center. This we will be starting it this year. The strategy for the IGUC is to look at research partnerships with individuals as well as institutions. We have signed up as well as announced research fellowships on our own develop courses and also develop centers. So we are right now in discussions with Baroda University as well as MIT University to set up centers in their campus. We hope to achieve scale through this strategy of research partnerships and developing courses and developing centers at various uh, universities. We have a center for Indic writers. We, see, we, we seek to nurture uh, uh, writers. We seek to publish writers and promote writers and over the last uh, three years, we have emerged as the largest platform to promote books. We have done more than 160 book launches. We are into publications and they're also into training. Like this month alone, we trained more than 20 people in writing. So these are the aspects of our IGUC center, uh, uh, writing center. We also have set up a center for soft power. The center for soft power looks at analysis, advocacy, and awareness. We have a platform called Soft Power Mag. And advocacy, we have set up a platform called NICE, wherein we are seeking to uh, nurture cultural entrepreneurship. We also have a research division to see how our culture is making a global impact. This is as far as the centers of excellence is concerned. We are now shortly starting two more centers, one center for sustainability, wherein we are looking at sustainability across agriculture. We are looking at sustainability in uh, uh, crafts and uh, Ayurveda. And look at the indigenous knowledge systems, go to the field and do research there. We're also setting up a center for inner transformation or center for spirituality, wherein we're looking at three kinds of courses. One course is a course to make, make, make yoga charyas, which is from Samskritam to sutras, from Kirtans, Badans, Bhajans, Chantings, and Yoga Sutras and Upanishads. So all that we overlaid on a typical 500 hour asana course. We're also looking at executive coaching as a part of this. Uh, and also to uh, to produce gurus in the traditional Vedantic system. This is what these are the five centers that uh, we have. We are also uh, we have a, a strategy of transforming intellectuals and we what we call as a strategy of self selfless and self. When we talk about self with a smaller self, we talk about helping a person discover his uh, his swadharma and nurturing that. Selfless is to make him think and invest in him to work on. Uh, uh, social entrepreneurship and self with the capitalist is to make him help him discover his true self. That is our strategy for transforming intellectuals at a broader level. More specifically, we look at courses, we conduct courses, we have offer research fellowships, we have more than 80 research fellowships that we are in the process of granting. We have already granted 20. We are, public, we are in publications. We have published 14 books. We are uh, conduct events. We have held 496 events as of 31st of March in the last four years. In this year alone, again, we've started, we've done about eight events. And we have also developed platforms wherein individuals, we nurture them as entrepreneurs. We have Indic Book Club, which is a platform being nurtured by, uh, nurtured with uh, uh, Abhinav Agarwal, wherein we are promoting books. We have uh, distributed more than 9,000 books through this platform. We have Indic Today, which is which is being run by Yogni Desh Pandey. She is the editor. And that's a, that's a platform for serious uh, and semi-serious uh, 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 knowledge uh, in, in Shastras, Indic knowledge systems and Indology. We have Indica Pictures, which is a platform for short uh, videos being uh, done by Gayatri Ayer. We have Indica Yoga being uh, run by Vinay Chandra. We have Indica Moksha being uh, uh, run by 
uh, Nitin Sridhar, which is a platform, which is the largest platform. We have more than 10,000 videos on uh, Vedanta. We are doing a global festival of uh, Adi Shankaracharya for 30 days now. We have iGen Plus, which is, uh, uh, which is uh, run by uh, Saumya Agrawal, which is a joint venture with her, which is targeted at children uh, up to high school. And over the last two years, we have made several interventions. And we have now set up NICE, which I mentioned earlier, which is a network of Indian cultural enterprises, which is going to be the NASCOM or the CIA of culture. Uh, Arunima Gupta is uh, heading that. And Softpair, Softpower Mag is, uh, is run by Vijayalakshmi, uh, Vijay Kumar, and Aparna Sridhar. These are all the platforms that we have. We, insofar as the ecosystem, we are consciously trying to build an ecosystem. The ecosystem we are trying to build, wherein we don't have a view we only are the infrastructure creators. Any ecosystem has two components. There's a living component. There's a non-living component. We are trying to invest in the non-living part. We don't have any views. We, we are diverse and inclusive and we welcome all views. And the way we look at uh, building this infra, uh, ecosystem is through a connect, cooperate and collaborate strategy with connections. We help uh, smaller people, smaller networks to form. We have city networks. We have networks in 30 cities. Over the last five years, we've developed these networks. We have domain-wise networks. Uh, networks is focused on uh, specific domains. And that's how we are trying to create this ecosystem of helping people connect each other. We have a corporate strategy wherein we give grants. We have emerged as the largest grant-giving organization in this space. We give grants for events, publications, research and fellowships, travel, and scholarships. We also also encourage collaborations. We collaborate with other institutions. Like I mentioned about research, we collaborate for finance, we collaborate for technical, we for collaborate for infrastructure. So that's our collaborative strategy. This is the overall uh, basis. We, the kind of events that we have uh, held are arranged from Vakirta Sadas to retreats, to workshops, conferences, walks, uh, uh, screenings, uh, book launches, indie talks. That's broadly uh, uh, what we do. Uh, I, I just take one more minute. We are, the several highlights and several uh, things that we have uh, achieved and which we are proud of uh, uh, in, in just in terms of uh, uh, when we look back in the last five years. But going forward, version IA, uh, what is IA 2.0? IA 2.0 is going to do two things. One is work with professors like Balu in a deeper and more meaningful manner and see how they can make a greater impact. So there's one aspect of that that's going to be very, very, and this year we are, we are, we are working with nine uh, such uh, uh, venerable scholars and looking at how to build the, their legacies. That's one very important thing that uh, I'm, I'm very deeply engaged with. And then there's another aspect of building a Gurukul here, multidisciplinary Gurukul here and the Inter-University Center. That's the second version. And the third version is to look at scale and how we can approach scale. We just gave 100 scholarships for publishing um, for, for first-time authors. So how do we get scale and, and, and reach out to a larger people? So this, this, this thing between richness and reach, and that's what we are trying to do. And I hope my five minutes is over. Thank you so much. Wow, fantastic. Mm. Yeah, thank you, Harikiran Garu. Um, so uh, I now request uh, Professor Balu to uh, take over. Uh, he has already... Um, has my screen stopped sharing? Uh, can you please stop? No, it has not stopped. Okay. Yeah. Has it stopped? No. <laughs> it's still there, sir. Huh? Still there. Oh, I'm so. Oh, okay, one second. Yeah, okay. now it's okay. Okay, thank so, you. So, uh, Professor Balu has already introduced uh, uh, the other panelists. Uh, so, I request Professor Balu to uh, start uh, session one after today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, actually, it's a bit difficult after Harikiran to say something. I'm still digesting what he has said. And the only question I have to you, Hari Kiran, is, is there anything you are not doing? Because you're doing so many things at so many levels. And uh, yeah, so I'm really, really well, excellent speechless. Now, of course, if I fall, become speechless now, the whole uh, thing will collapse, so I shall talk. Uh, but, but it's wonderful that especially you know, the thoughts 
you have about going forward, those three things that you mentioned, probably this is very, very important. And to come there, you had to build this very wide base at different levels that you have now. So I, 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 mean, I, mean, I, don't, I can't say I'm impressed because it's a very stupid word. I'm encouraged. Um, I, not, I can't say I'm optimistic because I've always been there. It gives me new energy. And the only thing I feel sad is all these things will happen when I'm not there to see it. I mean, the next 20 years, 30 years I'm talking about. But it's wonderful. It's really, very, really, really glad. Okay. Um, thank you, Bhai. Don't thank me for why you're, why you're, you are doing the work and you're thanking me for that. Uh, <laughs> anyway, it, what I would like to do is the idea is that it is a kind of a retrospective and a prospect. That is, if people must get some idea of where I'm coming from, the route I travel to where we are today. In a way, you see part of where we are today because the, some of the uh, others on the screen or the students who are coming out of the research program and continuing the search on their own. So I want to give you some idea of the last, this journey, but not in an autobiographical mode, but in terms of some images, some metaphors, that will be of some use for the discussion. Uh, as you have seen, you have received my first uh, document. It was written in 1985, it took about two years, three years work and even actually much before, many more years before that to come to the document. And then my problem was, as an Indian, how does the world look to us when we look at, when we see the world, how does it appear? Uh, I asked this question to myself based on my experience because in the process of building this paper, I read enormous amount of literature on India, especially beginning with travel reports and so on. First time I was reading such things. Uh, first time because before that I was a Marxist and I was never a nationalist, even now I'm not a nationalist. So I had not read this literature. Then I began, what strange thing was, I discovered when I started reading these multiple descriptions of travel logs, comparative law, comparative religion, etc., etc., I could not recognize the India they were describing. Meaning, it was not part of my experience. What they said about India was not the India I saw, I lived with, I grew up in. So this began, I began to go deeper and deeper into it. And I felt basically at an intuitive level, there is extremely difficult for me to describe how I saw the world. But one thing I knew, the world they, descri they were described in social sciences, different anthropology, law, and so on, psychology, etc., was not the world I lived in. Question is, which world did I live in? I used two kinds, and then as I began to go deeper into it, I discovered a very huge problem. I will use two metaphors or two imageries to describe where I was, and I'll use that to trace the uh, growth of or the next uh, the subsequent 40 years of my life it is one imagery would be imagine you have an incredibly huge heap of things bigger than himalaya huge but you don't know what it consists of for example there are spades screwdrivers brakes oh, oh everything rubbish but you don't know what they are. You don't know what are the elements that make up that heat. Not only that, you don't even know how to use them. Like, for example, you want to build a wall. Maybe there are bricks in it, but you can't recognize it as a brick. 
if you recognize it as a brick, you don't know how to use it to build a wall or a foundation. Can you use a brick to build a foundation of a house? You don't know. So this is a situation I confronted, an enormous material, extraordinarily huge, but not knowing what it consists of and not knowing how to make use of it. This is not only my problem, I began to discover, it's a problem of all of us in India. We actually don't know what there is and what we should use and how. Now, let's make the metaphor, this imagery a bit more concrete. And describe this uh, imagery in terms of materials, or books and, uh, and so on and so forth, literature. Now, imagine that you know the word daffodil, rose, what, what else? Just one word, daffodil, rose, some flower, some fruit. And you have this material in front of you, which people have told you is about daffodil, is about mango, whatever it is. So I'll just use the word daffodil as an example. Some of this material about the daffodil is in the form of verses. Some of them are in the form of essays. Some of them in the form of books. A huge material. And they say all kinds of things. Now, suppose you desire daffodil. You look at this material. You don't know anything about it when you look at them, what a daffodil is, because some verses put it in one way, a text puts it in a second way, and something about it is in the third way. You have no idea whether they're describing a daffodil, are there manuals for the daffodil, how can you get a daffodil, you, you don't know what questions they're answering, they huge material. And you're also told that they're all extremely important and that's a basic treasure is contained in the daffodil. Now make it a bit concrete. Let's use the word something like Abhyatma. There. And let's say the Indian culture has a unique contribution to make to the world and that's Abhyatma. And let's say all this literature is about Abhyatma. So daffodil becomes Abhyatma. When you read Seeking Adhyatma, you don't understand most of the literature. You see some awful prose, and then you're told, this is poetry, it is called Bhakti poetry, and it is rebelling against Brahmanical superiority. True or false, you don't know. But it reads awful. As poetry, you see, it's not, it's, it's not good, it does not rhyme. But they say that is exactly the special thing about it. So like this, so each thing, there are people defending it, people attacking it. It's about Adhyatma, and you don't understand anything about it. Now, this is a situation, if you describe in terms of literature. Keep the scenario, now add something new to it, namely, and let's get back to the metaphor of daffodils. Let's say we have, we understand what a daffodil is and how to grow it. And then you look at all these books, etc., this literature, suddenly with a new eye. Because now you know, a daffodil, it can be grown. You now read the literature and you say, oh, this poetry that talks about daffodil, it what is called poetic knowledge, it does not help you grow daffodil at all. Okay, maybe interesting to read, fantastic. Okay, but that's not what I need. You put it aside. Then you get a book, 500 pages long, let's say, which gives you description of the color of the petals of daffodil. Fantastic, but you're not going to spend a lot of time reading it because You'll be seeing daffodil yourself, so you put it aside. In other words, what you begin to do, 
is this incredible collection of confusion, confusing material, is ready to sort them out. Ah, this I can use, this may be useful or not, this I don't understand, and this is talking Hindi word, this is bakwas. So like this you'll start sifting the material. And then you discover that in some areas, for example, in the foothills of the Himalayas, daffodil grew very well, grows, but in your place, the soil doesn't help it. So you develop understanding of the soil, the nature of the environment. Maybe you'll build an agricultural shed because you want daffodils. In other words, as knowledge over daffodil accumulates, you are now beginning to distinguish material, learning how to do it and developing knowledge. This incredibly confusing collection where, for example, you, you look at Gita, you don't know what it is. Is it like Einstein's theory? Or is it like Maxwell, equi Maxwellian equation in thermodynamics? Is it like the lectures on physics of Richard Feynman, which students read even today to learn physics? Is it a secondary school textbook? We don't know about Gita, what it is. Now, when you have this knowledge of that Gita as an example, now when you have the same problem with this literature and daffodil, but once you learn what it is, why you want it and so on, it begins to make sense. You will say, this Gita, this is for master level, and this is not like Einstein's equations. It is before that. This goes beyond Maxwellian thermodynamics and so on and so forth. So as knowledge about daffodil, this is our culture accumulates. You not only become proficient in it, you are able to distinguish them from each other and also discover that most of the literature in daffodil are actually not interesting. What you thought bad poetry is bad poetry. And that's not a revolution, rebellion against anything. It's simply talking bakwas. This is the route in some senses that I traveled from 85 of sifting material, seeing what they are about, beginning to understand that this whole heap that confronts us, there are also manuals in it, there are descriptions of it, there is knowledge, and there is also a lot of nonsense. Therefore, I question how does the world appear to us when we look at it our way? By the time of 2012, now we are talking talking about 25 years of research or more, I begin to see that the next generation, subsequent generation of Indians will face one fundamental problem, which is our task, not a problem, task, which is asking the question about what it means or what it is to be Indian or Asian. And because India, with talking about India, let me confine myself to India. So what is it to be Indian? So in the preface, in the conclusion of the material you have received from reconceptualizing India studies, that was, I said, task of the future generation, the next subsequent generation. And I thought my, and that is what I was doing those 25 years. I said, what we need to do now is begin the process of shifting, sifting, wheat from shaft, as they say, the good from the bad, knowledge from the past. So start, and one other thing was, I discovered in this 25 years, that a lot of Bakwas had to do, in fact, almost all of it that I encountered, had to do with scholarship produced in the Western culture, in Western culture, Europe and America and so on, and Indians imitated very blindly, as blindly as uh, many of us do today, especially younger children, is uh, to be modern is to have iPhone, to be Nike, and so on and so forth. So this way of imitation, that's what most Indian intellectuals were doing for more than 100, 150 years. They were repeating and reproducing stories from the West. 
storage meaning from the social sciences. So after about 25 years, I discovered that my task consists of fundamentally clearing that dead wood to allow you, the young people, the future generation, to go and answer the question, what is India? What is it to be Indian? And what were our, our, our ancestors for 2,000, 3,000 years? What were they doing? Because the story I was brought up in, while these people defended caste system, sati, dowry, and so on and so forth. And as they say in my literature, only good thing was we had a Gandhi, we had a Buddha, and both fought, especially Buddha, fought against Brahminism, Hinduism, and no one then somebody would tell us, you also discovered zero. The point is we did not discover zero, maybe we did, but what they were saying is something different. India is a big zero, they were saying. And that's true. Not how it was, but what had happened in the last hundred years. What India did, what India was, is a big zero. So therefore, to build something out of, at, in that space, you had to clear the dead wood. So I spent a lot of time studying and training people to look at sociology, political science, psychology, anthropology, comparative law, and so on, multiple domains, interrogating what the problem was in these theory, so-called theories about society and culture. And what is the problem when we took them over and reproduced them mindlessly? Like, for example, Indian liberals keep on talking about extraordinary thing about liberalism, and tolerance. And because until before liberalism came, that was the situation, we did no tolerance. Talking about human rights, suggesting that thanks to human rights, we don't, let's say, torture people with different political opinions. Meaning, where there is no human rights, there is, there is for example, torturing of political prisoners. I discovered that, for example, there was never torturing of political prisoners for 2,000 years in Indian literature. Maybe there was there in Indian society, it's not there in the literature. An absence of ideas of human rights does not mean that we trample and torture human beings. So you don't need that to, do, to, to, to respect individuals. So the question is, what else did we have? How did we do that? And then I discovered, for example, human rights actually is emerges in a theological debate in Europe for 150 years within Catholic Church, which is the Franciscan and the Dominicans. And it requires assumptions, ideas about God, Jesus, and so on and so forth. Simply put, I just began to see that Western social sciences were not sciences at all. They were to use a use, loose word today, ideologies. They are not sciences. So when Indian sociologists, Indian political scientists, Indian anthropologists, and so on and so on and so on, use that to understand India, they were actually selling an ideology, series of ideologies, perhaps. And that is why you find none of the Indian social scientists have produced anything which is important, even though someone like Amartya Sen got a Nobel Prize for his work. But that is purely mathematical economics. It's not anything about India. So it's not that we don't have brilliant people who, who don't get Nobel Prizes, though we don't get many. Reproducing Western theories, Western stories about India doesn't take us forward, so clear the dead. The task I set for the future, what does it mean to be an Indian? The third and the th book now I'm writing, not the third book, the third, this is 2020, the book I'm now writing, carries the title, What Does It Mean to Be Indian? That is to say, the task, of the, it is not a task for the future generations alone, but it's a task we have to start addressing today with the hope, definitely, of developing it further. Now, if you look at this sketch, very light sketch I have given, you notice something interesting. 
I began with the idea, how does the world look to us? And I say there, look, we can't assess Western social sciences today. We don't have, we don't know how to do it. We express our intuitions looking at Western social theories. 1985. By 2012 already, I'm saying, no, we have to think about what is to be an Indian. And I began to criticize Western social theories without developing a, a good alternative as yet. Because we were able to, I was able to see that these theories were not expressing any kind of knowledge. And that's why you can criticize it, even if there are no alternative theories. Now, this is the third phase, where I'm talking about, what is it to be Indian? And underlying that, if you have read it carefully, you say that that question is going to give us or lay the foundation for real, true sciences of society and culture. That is a strange thing. If we understand, answer the question about what is to be an Indian, we'll be generating, creating, building a foundation for social science. Now, if some of you amongst you are computer scientists or physicists, you will notice something. You, especially computer scientists, about 70s or so, developed the phrase, it is called narrowing the search space. And they're very, very important for writing programs in order to find solutions like how to play chess, or how to do some medical diagnosis using artificial intelligence, whatever. In other words, as your knowledge progresses, if you want it to progress, you must start narrowing the space where you're going to search, within which you're going to search for a solution. Let's take an example of today, COVID-19. We don't know yet how to cure it. Vaguely know how it is communicated, transmitted. But one thing we do know, we know where to look for the solution. That is, if somebody comes and tells you, you know what, the best way to uh, cure COVID and find out what it is, is to go and take a bath in the Ganges, in Ganga. You know, maybe it will help, but that's not the place I had to look for the solution. Or if somebody says, no, no, what I have to go is go to Tirupati and uh, pray to Lord Venkatesh. Maybe you'll do it, but you know that cannot be the cure, even if it cures one or two or three or even 300 people. In other words, or if somebody comes, make it a bit more ridiculous. You know what? If we change all our names, for instance, Sigmund Freud did not have COVID-19. Therefore, it follows, if we call ourselves Freud, we will be cured of COVID-19. You will find it ridiculous. Why? Because you know whatever, wherever the solution is, for COVID-19, it will not lie in the name you're going to give. Therefore, even if you even if you love Freud and change your uh, name, for example, Balgan Gajara Freud doesn't like uh, like like Frederick Ganapati Shastri, you know. Uh, so we can mix names. Uh, it won't solve the problem. We know that already. What has happened? It says look in physiology, look in virology. Look in, and, and so on. If you want to solve the problem of COVID-19, don't even go to physics, whether E equals MC squared is true or false, because that won't solve the problem of COVID-19. So our search space matters. We know where to look for solutions, whether we find them or not. Whether solutions you find are true or false, we know where to look. Now, this is very, very typical of all knowledge, and only of knowledge and all science, and only a science. As we understand, as we develop the, our theories about the world, the search space begins to narrow. Or in simpler terms, we begin to ask smaller and smaller questions which have bigger and bigger implications. This is a characteristic property of all knowledge, and only of knowledge. Now this is important to ask. How does the world look to you? 
when we look at it our way from there the question goes to let us criticize change western social sciences specific to what is to be indian the question narrows because of the increase in knowledge now i realize that that question which has become very sharp because in a way it has easy answers ah, what is it to be indian very simple get an indian passport of course we know that's not the answer why not because it's like saying change your name to sigmund freud to cure covid 19 so this is the question when it narrows it also tells you where to look for it one and what counts as an answer the root in other words why is it so important to know this to tell you this is to give you two things which are important which you must use well there are many people in the marketplace including me who are selling you stories about what india is what indian culture is what indian religions are and so on and so forth question is how do you choose what story will you pick and why The route I have followed that I have, is also a way, the, the criteria to test whether any of these stories, including mine, is knowledge or not. And how do you do that? See if the story of that research continues to narrow search space, ask more and more precise questions, does it allow what problems does it solve what problems does it not solve what are the alternative theories in other words this track that i have followed the last 40 years i claim is the track of knowledge or developing understanding of human beings and their society so when you come across stories telling you what india is what indian culture is what the west is and why we should not, we should attack the West, etc., etc., etc. Because they're talking about human beings and society. Use this criteria. How did it develop? Not biographical details, but how does it research them? Practically. Ask questions. Does it narrow search space? Does it ask interesting questions? Solve. In other words, solve new problems. In other words, use these criteria to judge and to choose because what we need is not a jnana what we need is jnana in other words not bakwas and ignorance but knowledge so what i present to you today is not simply a story that that has been built over the last 40 years but a story which seems as though seems to appear that it has the properties of knowledge, properties of scientific thinking, because it is tracking exactly the route that knowledge and science follow. So use it to test what we are going to say today, to test what you're going to hear tomorrow or day after. The Kashino says this is first in a series where they're going to invite great scholars to come and talk. Test it. Test it with these. Is it knowledge? Is it jnana? Or is it a gnya? Only that way we can go forward. So the question, what is it to be an Indian, is not a story about a psychology or about a adhyatma in abstract. No. The answer to that question will tell us what sciences are social, what knowledge of human beings and society is going to be. Now, there is something funny which is my first attempt at this was we shall not cease from exploration written in 1985. Funnily enough, there is also the text, the first text my students had to read when they came to study under me in the University of Ghent. I usually enjoyed writing that text. You see, those days there was no computers, nothing of the sort. So I wrote it, and my poor wife, she would type it on the typewriter. Now, why I'm telling you that she typed on the typewriter? Because the mistakes that you will see in the text, typing mistakes, were not writing mistakes. I wrote perfectly. 
and my work. So if there are any problems in the text, catch hold of my wife and criticize her for not being able to type properly. And she claimed that she could type blind. You know, not, not look at the keyboard. Say, when you close your eyes and do things, you don't know what the hell you're doing. So this blind typing, it is absolutely chaotic. So you'll discover that in that document. But nevertheless, I enjoyed writing it. Ha, my poor budget <laughs> students. When I came to my class, they had to read it and do lots of things with it. And they have informed me regularly that it was not terrible uh, experience, that I was a terrorizing person, a tyrannical person, and the most horrible experience, untrue by the way, nevertheless, that's what they say, horrible experience, you read, we shall not say some explanation. Ask yourself, seriously. I mean, you read it. Don't you find it really beautiful text? I don't know. I think Jacob the Rover, my first student, and now he's Professor Dr. Jacob the Rover, also my first colleague, was one of those unfortunate victims of we shall not see from exploration experiment. I love experiments, as you know. And I did the experiment. He was experimental subject, poor fellow. <laughs> Maybe Jacob can assure me that it was also a wonderful experience. And if he does not, kindly don't believe a word of what he says. Jacob. Well, see people, um, what, many of the things that Balu told you about our experience are true. And I'm still recovering, by the way. So if I look a bit angry, it's because I'm still recovering. It's not because I'm angry at you. Not recovering from the text. I mean, it's a beautifully written text, as ah, Bhagavad said. Uh, recovering from all that came with it. Because reading the text and the way Balu gave it to us now, almost 25 years back, and we're all getting older, was a very interesting experience. You see, we, we started this program in comparative science of cultures, expecting to learn about exotic cultures uh, with different belief systems and worldviews and religions, different moral values, different political systems. That's what we expected. Now, the f very first text Balu gave us was we shall not seize. And what he asked us to do was just write down our intuitive reactions in a document. And it didn't matter how long, what form, just write down your intuitive reactions. So I, I don't remember exactly what I wrote, but vaguely I can reconstruct it. I know it was about how it's very interesting to see that Indians have a very different worldview and a different conception of self and how we should respect their beliefs and their moral values and so on. Now then the master's program continued and we expected to learn more about this very different culture. What we'd heard before was the stories that you're also familiar with. India means all kinds of religions, lots of rituals, caste system, of course, the bad Brahmin and so on. So we wanted to learn more. Now, the major course that we got from Balu was a course in small groups, I mean, between five and 10 maximum. And we read the Hedon with him, the Hedon and his blindness, which was based on his doctorate. Interestingly, we didn't learn anything about India initially. We began to learn about our own culture, Western culture. And why that's important is uh, some of the questions that we received are about Western descriptions of India, the kinds of questions that Europeans and Americans keep raising about why do you believe in so many gods? Uh, why are you so casteist and so on? Now, it's not only for Indians that it becomes very important there to study Western culture, to understand India. What became clear to us over that first year in the master's program is that it was incredibly important for European students too, that we did not understand our own culture at all. 
that the stories we knew about, okay, we used to have Christianity, there's some people who still believe in Christianity. I, to me, I, I was raised in an atheist family, so they're kind of weird creatures who had all kinds of weird beliefs. But, so we've grown out of that. We now have a secular state. Um, we have equality, democracy, and other cultures have different belief systems. India has believes in caste system, Hinduism, etc. That all of this not only wasn't true, but it was simply a story about how Western culture saw itself and saw others, and not uh, a description or knowledge about ourselves and those others. So what Balu says in, in We Shall Not See is that the world, our own world looks alien to us, uh, like addressing Asians, our experience of going through that first year was one where our own world also became alien to us. So what we thought we knew was not knowledge at all, certainly not about Indian culture. And we had to understand our own culture before we could ever come to understand Indian culture. So that kind of movement, I, it's something that always strikes me that the, the problem when, when we say that Indians should learn about Western culture to understand India, it's not some problems, problem that Indians confront alone. And it's a problem that we also confront. It's not that we know our own culture as rubbish. What we have, as Balu sometimes put it, puts it, is a PR story. It's a PR story of Western culture where, see, we... Initially, we had this fantastic Greco-Roman, very rational, philosophical culture. Then Christianity came, but then we escaped from that. The Renaissance came, Enlightenment came, Scientific Revolution came, democracy, legal system, and Western culture became this fantastic culture. That's the story we got from, uh, from primary school onwards. And instead, while learning that our stories about India are not about India at all, but about Western culture, we also began to see that our stories about Western culture are simply not knowledge. That social sciences, as we had learned them, I mean, vaguely, it's not that we had been trained very well, but we'd learned some of the theories in, in social sciences about what society, politics, religion, etc., are like that these social sciences did not give us knowledge at all, again. So, I have this, I mean, Balu didn't go into autobiographical mode. Uh, I, I want to do that because while I was thinking about this, I had this beautiful memory. See, in these classes, as the year progressed, the classes on the Hedon, I mean, where we sat together with Balu, groups of five, at some point, when it had become clear to us that we didn't understand our own culture, he started emphasizing, see, social sciences will come into being through reflection on experience. You have to reflect on experience. And that's how you gain understanding, gain knowledge of, of human, be human beings. So I remember re being puzzled by that statement. I mean, I, knew how to use the word experience, reflect, it's not that I used it all that often, but I understood the sentence, reflect on experience. But I didn't know what the hell it meant. And I remember, I still live by a canal. Back then, I also lived by the same canal, the, the other side of town. So I had to walk home from those classes to my, uh, my house. I walked by the canal. I kept wondering, yeah, I have to reflect on experience kept repeating it, uh, sensing that uh, my own world had become alien to me and that reflection on experience was very important to begin to discover what my world was really like. Also, finding out that social sciences didn't help there. I mean, it's not like the, the theories that we had available about religion, Christianity, how we had become secular, how democracy came into being, helped me there. 
So I, I could still see the footpath along which I walked. And that, that phrase keeps reverberating, that we have to reflect on experience. Now, at the end of the year, we had all forgotten about the intuitive reactions we had given to we shall not cease from exploration. And we had simply forgotten. We didn't remember that we had to write those. So Valu said, okay, now turn back, read the text you wrote, and correct it. Reflect on it, correct it. So it was a shock to reread that after this one year course to discover that these intuitive reactions were precisely all the stories that we discovered were false, were not knowledge. I, 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 I remember that I really said, see, different cultures have different belief systems. I referred to the Asmat of Indonesia, some kind of exotic tribe, saying that we have to respect those belief systems. They have their own religion and worldview. They have their own moral values. So something else happened. Valu asked us to reflect on that text. All of us wrote a completely different text, which had nothing to do with that first text. I mean, we didn't reflect on it. So he said, I mean, you're not reflecting on the text that you wrote. You're not trying to correct it. You're writing a completely new story. And typically, Balu, now reflect on that. Why you wrote a different text instead of thinking about what you believed one year ago, how you thought one year ago. So when Indians today, when, when we're saying to understand India, you have to first understand Western culture, it's not some unique situation. It's a situation everyone in the world faces, including Westerners. We don't understand our own culture, not at all. We have a bogus story about our own culture. So for us also, this is a kind of accessing our own culture, the research program that's developing. And what Balu has been teaching us is, well, with mixed okay. success, is yeah. accessing our own culture. I want to ask you a question because if I let this guy go on, Oh yeah, sorry. He will start undercutting everything I'm going to say. So, believe only a little bit of what he told. Good things about me, you're allowed to believe. But there is an important thing he's saying. See, we in India believe that we must be Locke, John Stuart Mill, Karl Marx, Edward Said, Jacques Derrida, and so on and so on. Turn. If we have to understand what's going on in India, to understand Indian political system today, if you read the Western media and Indian media, both, you know that today minority religions are persecuted. You know that Hindutva is leading it. And Modi not quite sure whether he's a fascist or a Hindu fundamentalist, probably both. And there's something fundamentally wrong with fundamentalism, which Indian leadership has. And all minority religions, this is not democracy, but it's a majoritarian rule. And this story, I mean, you, you just read the Indian newspapers, see the TV, it's full of it. And Western media is also full of it. Now, if we use these theories of democracy, society, and so on and so forth, to understand India, yeah? Sorry, my computer froze. Oh, she's terrified. Okay. <laughs> uh, come, no, come, no, come, come, come. No, no. What no. happened? The computer froze. Yeah, the laptop. Ah. It, it started to update itself. Oh, update. Okay. Yeah. Updating is necessary. Yeah. Yes. But not at a very inconvenient time. You can, you can block the update. It just started on the ah, side. All right, fine. So anyway, this says that though it is we use in some senses 
West, not in some sense, in all senses, Western theories to understand India. What's Jacob say? The Western stories about India, or Western stories about itself, forget India, about democracy and so on and so forth, is a huge public relations exercise. That's how he's experiencing it. Not just he, my students are began to see that what they are told about themselves, about Western culture, is a PR exercise. Can I just add something there? Yeah. Um, there's, a, there's an important question behind what, what Jacob is saying, that to understand Western culture, that to understand India, you have to understand the Western culture. There, if you reverse the question, there's an equally uh, important dimension, which he partially has pointed out, that you have to, to understand the Western culture, you also have to study it, of course, that's what he said, but to understand what happens when you, is going to reverse, yeah, what happens when you try to understand, that when you try to understand Western culture, you also have to study India. Let me take one example um, of one thread that's been very common uh, in the last 2000 years of Western history, especially in the last uh, 100 years, it's become, uh, come very strongly to the surface. Um, I'm talking about the Holocaust, the, the Shoah and anti-Semitism. It's one thread that you see uh, constantly recurring in the history of European tradition, uh, in history of European culture. And... No. Uh, they, wait, I, I forgot what I was No, 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 no. Uh, let me just link yeah. it up in a different way. Let, 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 let me reformulate the question, if, if you'll allow me. Yes. I suddenly lost track of what... Doesn't matter, doesn't matter. If Western... If what West says about itself is a public relations story. What does it mean to understand Western culture, one? And therefore, what does it mean to say to understand Indian culture, you need to understand the Western culture? What does it mean in the sense if the stories about Western culture, theories in politics, society, and policy, law, etc., is public relation? Then what you understand is that Western culture is something that generates the public relation stories about itself and tells other cultures, look, this is how you must be. Yeah. So just, just to pick up from there. Um, one of the things that is very typical of the story West tells about itself is how it has um, enlightenment values. So Jacob just sketched the history, you know, first they had these Greek or Roman empires and Christianity, then it was terrible, and then they escaped from it. And they had these enlight the period of enlightenment and these amazing values emerged out of it. Tolerance, uh, democracy, rule of law, all these things were results of the period of enlightenment. And what is also very typical of the PR story and what we're told in India today, India is communalist, a uh, huge problem with the minorities, um, yeah, the, the growth of the Hindu fundamentalist movement, and India should learn to be less authoritarian, which is it's becoming, and more tolerant towards other cultures. Now, if you actually look at what is happening, there's something very, very strange. So that is the thread of anti-Semitism. Over the last 2,000 years, you've seen a hatred towards the Jews, which is called anti-Semitism, in Europe that recurs at multiple points in time. Now, it is also common sense. Uh, many people have pointed it out. It's been said many a number of times that India is the only country in the world where Jews were not persecuted, that they were treated very well. And uh, there are small communities of Jews in, in Kerala and in, in Bombay. And um, some other places as Bengal. well, Bengal, yeah. So, but just that fact, it's a very interesting fact, but what, it's not, that's not enough to say, oh yeah, but you know, India used to be a pluralistic society, or India used to have tolerance, it doesn't have it anymore, it doesn't tell us anything. Because if you look at the history of anti-Semitism, I'll just take two examples. One, one of the, re two, two reasons why Jews were really hated in Europe, and this kept coming back, is Jews' relationship to money. They were described as greedy, they were described as money lenders, they were uh, always trying to uh, become wealthy, and it was a very ugly thing. So they would 
Um, let's think of Shakespeare. Yeah, Shylock. Shakespeare, Shylock in Shakespeare. So pound of flesh. The pound of flesh. So that's your prototy prototypical Jew. Jew who is out to get money from you. Fleece you for money. Bleed you dry. Mm -hmm. That is one aspect. You have another aspect which uh, is also uh, a running thread in uh, the history of anti-Semitism in Europe, is the idea of the king of the Jews. The Jews have been waiting for their king. He is their messiah. For, two, for many thousands of years, they've been waiting for him. They've been promised that he will come. And that's the bone of contention between them and Christianity. Christians say he has already come. That is Jesus of Nazareth. He is the messiah. He has arrived. And they became Christians. Jews said, no, 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 he's not the king of the Jews, he's not the Messiah, not the Savior. So that has been another uh, problem, that the Jews were waiting for their own king. Yeah, but you must understand why. It's important to add that. If you know a little bit about the history of Jews in the Bible, the Jews were scattered all over the world because yeah. they did not worship and follow the God of Israel. So why are they waiting for the king? Is that Coming of such a king will bring back all the Jews together, unite them, yeah. and bring them from exile because they were all living in exile. It was the diaspora of the Jews. Diaspora means that people exiled. So they're waiting for the king because he alone could unite the Jews. And they would be, of course, very, very loyal to that king and only to that king. Yeah. So that was another problem. And why was it a problem? Because uh, Roman emperors and the Christian kings that came after, they said, well, you're waiting for your own king. You're loyal, you're loyal only to your own king who's not yet come, which means you're not loyal to us. You're not loyal to the emperor here, the king here. You're constantly trying to conspire. So the whole idea of the Jewish conspiracy that lives to this day also is fed from this idea that they're not loyal to the, to the king, to the sovereign power that is there. It's worse. They're committing treason. They're committing treason. That's because true. they're disloyal to the king. They're trying to depose him yeah. and put their own king. Yeah. So there are two, these are two threats that uh, you find in the history of anti-Semitism in your over, over more than 2000 years of Europe. Now, if you look at India, what you see is the fallen. So these small communities of Europe at different times uh, escaping persecution and hatred and, and, uh, murder from in, in Europe and, and they washed on, I mean, they came to the, ran away to India at, at different times in, in history, you know, 2000 years ago, then again in the 1600s and then again in 1800s. So they came at multiple times. And one of the uh, early things, they, they landed on a place called uh, Shingli. So it's a little village or a little princely state. It was called Shingli. And um, they landed there and the they were able to establish the Indian kings who were there about 2,000 years ago who were there. Said, oh, look, okay, you're here, here, you can, you can have land, you can, you can establish yourself, no problem. Okay, you're, you have your king, it's perfectly fine. You, you seem to be very loyal to him, okay, very good. And the Jews established themselves, they, they traded, they, you know, they were very good in, in finances. That was extremely appreciated. They said, oh, these people are extremely trustworthy. If you enter into monetary relationships with respect to money with them, then you can always rely on them. So the very two things, and they grew, and they were never, never persecuted. I mean, they, they were able to maintain their autonomy. They were able to maintain, keep to their traditions. They had their king. They could say, okay, no, we have our own king. We're waiting for him. He's not yet come, which means we have a different relationship to you as a king. No problem. We're going to try and become wealthy and, and try and have a very, you know, be Money lending, completely okay. No, no, no. <laughs> there's something more, more interesting than that. So here you have the Indian kings. Just, just think about it. You have the European kings, and the Jews said, we're waiting for your king. They're accused of treason. So they made the Indian princes in different parts of India, Bengal, Bombay, Maharashtra, and now Kerala, and so on. And they were asked, what are you waiting for? We're waiting for our king. And they would tell these local kings, you are not our king. And what did our kings do? Oh, you are a wonderful people. That you are so loyal to your king. That is exactly how it should be. Fantastic. You know what? We are going to support you. 
Yeah, and this so, was so much so that it stayed. And the, the stake first came 1780, so that's really 2,000 years ago. And this, this continued, this kind of support and, and appreciation for it. So much so, it was famous across uh, European Jewry that this was the case. Like in 14th century, um, a rabbi, a Jewish rabbi and a poet, um, in travel, he, he writes, I traveled from Spain. I heard of the city of Shingli. I longed to see an Israeli king. Him I saw with my own eyes. <laughs> okay. So that's one. Second, these people, they lent money and had huge wealth. And what did they do? What did they do in Europe? Yeah. You want to say something? Yeah, no, continue. So they wanted, uh, so what did the kings do in Europe? They taxed the Jews took away their wealth because the kings needed it. To go to wars. And to do other things, like drink beautiful wine and so on, also. So anyway, Bordeaux wines, they're wonderful wines. Maybe. So anyway, so they tax these kings, uh, sorry, the Jews. And of course, they were money lenders, as you know, as you said, remember Shakespeare and so on, so money lenders. So the, two, yeah. so the two very things. Wait, wait, wait. Let, let, let okay, so, sorry, sorry. But poor Bagesh in India also suffered for that, you must be honest. These Marwaris lost their reputation. They found the Jews are better than Marwaris. Because Jews were loyal, they gave you the money, they had a lot of wealth, they were very honest, a very fair uh, interest rate. And very good merchants also. Yeah. So the Marwaris had a huge competition in Jews. And Marwari is lost to the Jews. So, in other words, precisely what was the reason 2,000 years to kill people, programs, and ended in the final solution with Hitler, precisely those reasons generated the opposite effect in India. Yeah, I, I wanted to say exactly yeah. that. But, um, so it's not simply a question of pluralism or tolerance or Jews are not persecuted in India. It's something far more uh, interesting. And what's interesting is, is, is that fact that that which was reviled and hated it was exactly that which was appreciated. So what was treasonous and, and uh, disloyal was considered in a, a, a sign of loyalty and was appreciated. What they saw as money lending and bleeding people dry was, was uh, seen and appreciated as trustworthy tradesmen and, and monetary relationships that they could have. So it's, it's as if what was acid or what was burning in one place, what was considered absolutely ugly and dangerous, became something completely opposite and, and, and beautiful. And, and this shows, this raises the following question. Now let's formulate it in terms of how Jacob raised it. Yeah. If to understand India, you have to understand Western culture. We are now discovering something else. To understand Western culture, we must, first, we must understand Indian culture. You don't understand Western culture by studying their books, but by seeing how they lived with each other. And to understand why there is anti-Semitism in Europe, in European society, European culture, there's just one example. You have to understand why the same things did not generate hatred of the Jews in places where there were Christians, where there were Muslims, and let's say Hindus. Yeah, the exactly same people were anywhere else, whether it's the Middle East or Europe, who were persecuting these people and who uh, hated them. And there was enormous... Uh, tragedy because of that. It's exactly the same people managed to live without animosity and hostility and hatred towards each other in a completely different place. So, so, raises, yeah. Yeah. so this raises, and now, look at the issue. So, two things we have. To understand Western culture, to understand Indian culture, to understand Western culture, understand Western culture, but understand Indian culture. And the hatred between communities, say the Jews and the Christians, the Jews and the Muslims, was absent in India. This is what my beautiful daughter has said. No, but a bit nervous. She's young, young, young girl. Is she? She's hardly 18 years old. Is she? Yeah, oh, you look 18. It's okay. No, right. it's okay. No, no, she does not look 18. Fine. Now, 
this means the following. Uh, this suggests the following. If the, if the Indians could live that well, which and the Christians and the Jew, uh, 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 Hindus could live so well with the Jews, what happened then? Or what is happening? Or what, what is it that we saw when India was partitioned between a Hindu part and a Muslim part? There we have, for example, take one image, Gandhi. He goes into huge periods of fasting to prevent the clash between Hindus and Muslims. Today we talk about communalism, which Hindus are, as a majoritarians are encouraging, and Muslims as a minority are being persecuted. And if you look at how Muslims talk, they say, you know, we are searching for the true God, we are searching for the truth, and that Indian uh, society and culture, especially Indian gods, are not true gods. And at the same time, that is their story, that's how they put it, at least some elements of it. And then you have the Indian reaction to that, which says, you people are trying to convert us. You want Indians to be converted into Islam or to Christianity or to other religions. And Gandhi was so bothered with it, he said, be a good Muslim, be a good Christian, be a good uh, uh, Jew or uh, be a good Hindu. Please don't convert. Now, what exactly is going on? Now we are studying Indian culture using the West. What exactly is this conversion that we are afraid of, that Gandhi was afraid of, people react against? What is a conversion that the Christians and the Muslims want to do? And what exactly is this true God they're all searching for, which they say we Indians don't have? This will help us make us understand not only better what India is, because they'll be understanding what Christianity, what Islam, etc., what they are talking about, what conversion means, and so on. And Sarah actually, I converted her. You actually what? converted me. So, to what? Uh, when, when you go to these conversion stories, uh, you have people coming and confessing, witnessing, as they call it. Yes, sir. Somebody is saying something. Are you saying something? No. Okay. <coughs> so you have you need people to come and witness, bear witness to the truth, bear witness to God, and so on. In all conversion uh, meetings, they have this. So mm -hmm. I am also I have read it. I, my soul is not saved. I'm still not a Christian, but I like some of the practices, which is basically to convert people. Especially when who I convert is a is a beautiful girl like Sai. Now I hope better than Jacob. I hope she'll tell such a beautiful story about her conversion to Baluism. <laughs> I will not talk about that. Ah. But uh, thank you, Bal, please, for please, please. thank you, Bal, for also inviting me to say a couple of things because you were just talking about this question of truth. Um, and conversion, and yeah, I, in my research, I stumbled across this question many times, and it's a very difficult point, because uh, when I was studying Gandhi, and uh, I also studied the debates uh, in the Constituent Assembly uh, before formulating the Indian Constitution, um, this problem came to the surface many times, and it was very, very difficult for me to start seeing what the problem was. Of course, my primary question was about religious conversion. I, I, I wanted to understand what is this debate uh, on religious conversion actually about? Because whenever you read like some social scientific literature on it, it doesn't tell you anything. You can read Jafra Lowe, there's no explanations, no insights into the situation. So 
Um, but reading Gandhi, okay, he talks, as you were saying, you were quoting him. Um, he says things like, people should not change or convert from one compartment to another. Let a Christian be good Christian. Let a Hindu be good Hindu. Let a Muslim be a good Muslim. But there are two things there. And it really surprised me a lot that in all the literature, you don't find these questions. On the one hand, the very interesting question is, what actually is Gandhi talking about? Because apparently he's talking about some background attitude, which, which is very Indian, which makes sense to many people. What he is saying there is one thing. But on the other hand, when he's talking like that in English, with these English words, he's just, it's in, incoherent. And it's very clear that he doesn't understand Christianity and, and, and uh, Islam in the sense that you cannot just, it does, it does matter which position you take on the truth, because the truth is Allah or God, and you have to convert to him. So these, these elements are there. And also in the constituent assembly debates, people just talk, they use words like conscience, um, religion, conversion, will, truth, and especially this, this uh, truth. Um, I hope, Balu, you will talk more about it also. It, it's also there in your texts, partly, um, because how they are using it, it's, it's not understandable. And Gandhi is talking in his, in his uh, autobiography. It's called My Experience with Truth. But what does it mean there, truth? It cannot be, he cannot be talking about this, this search for God in the, in the Western sense, what it means, like in Christianity. He cannot be talking about that. What is he talking about? But he does talk like that. He uses these, these word, words, which have all these connotations and these meanings. So um, this is very, uh, yeah. You, in the beginning, in your introduction, you were saying that we have to clear a lot of dead wood. My, my feeling is also that this has been a lot of my research also, try, try to start clearing the dead wood. And I will end by giving one example also of that. In the constituent assembly debates, you have this whole debate about propagate, the word propagate. Um, and it's, it's very clear that actually most of the Congress people, they don't want this word there. They don't want to include propagate in the Indian constitution. And in the debates they're having, I've been reading all the, the commissions that, that prepared all the formulations and all their initial stages. People are saying, why should we include propagate? Already freedom of religion is there. Already freedom of speech is there. There's freedom of speech. Why should propagate be added? But this clearly shows that they did not understand the demand or, or, or what Christians were asking, because they want, wanted to include this word, propagate, and it meant conversion. It meant a specific Christian thing. But actually, the different parties talking, the different sides of the debate, people were really not understanding each other. They were not understanding each other's concerns. And this is very serious, because the result is that they have included this word in the Indian constitution until today, this creates so many problems. Till today, you cannot solve whether or not propagate includes conversion or not. So, and it's the result of the fact that they were talking next to each other. They did not understand each other. They did not understand Christianity, the congressmen who were talking about this and making decisions about this. So, um, Again, um, I want to stress this importance of, of yeah, understanding the West, understand Indian debates, and the other way around. Um, Can I put it this way? Sir? Yeah. Would you say that those, because you're talking about constitution, constitute assembly debates, discussion about religious conversion, propagating one's religion, you say that they don't understand, they did not understand, or they did not appear to understand Christianity, what propagation means, and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. 
if I were to raise Chaitra, the question, namely, does it mean that when Indians read Western texts, whether political, the theological, philosophical, whatever, that they confronted a problem, namely of not being able to understand the Western texts, Western theories, Western notions. How would you respond to that? Uh, yeah, there are a whole uh, uh, range of issues that we can uh, talk about. See, I, I can start with one of our uh, students in Arohi is focusing on translation studies. And uh, in the early translation in the 20th century that he looked at, see, some of the very important scholars in Canada, they were real scholars, they were trained in English well, I mean, they were very good scholars in Canada. He wanted to translate some of the poetry that was written way back in the uh, 16th century, 17th century in the Europe. And this appear, apparently is one of the best contribution uh, to Kannada translation, etc. It's titled English Gita. So if you look at uh, some of the texts, say for example, there is a one example that we can I can start to communicate what is the difficulty and take it further. So there is this poem called The Character of Happy Life. Now, what this, po this poetry is about, is that there is a poet who is describing, you know, how one should live to be happy. And in that, you know, there is this description of talking about, so how happy is he born not to serve an other's will? Not, he was born and taught not to serve an other's will. Now it gets translated into Kannada language in this way. Now, one of the projects that he was actually trying to launch in the early part of the 20th century is to bring Western culture to India and take Indian culture to West so that, you know, there is an exchange that is happening. And let's look at what is his translation. Now, one of the things it does is, see, if you read the Kannada lines, that, so the person who is not, so he translates will as itche into Kannada language when he's writing it in Kannada for Kannada audience. Now, the moment you replace itche with the word, you read it in Kannada, okay, the person is very happy who is bar not to follow others with And a person who is taught to not to follow others with is very happy. See, take this two situation. For example, what it means to say that you don't follow another with when you are learning something, when you're, somebody is teaching, he is giving you homework, he is giving you assignment, and you know he is giving you a lot of tasks to do. And only if you learn what your teacher says that you will be able to see it. And if you are taught to not to learn other itche, say for instance, in this case, teachers, itche, you know, the sentences in Canada looks completely ridiculous. I mean, you just can't understand it. Okay, in the same way, now come back. Now imagine that we Canadians understand it as though that this English poet wrote not to follow other itche when you are born, not to follow other itche when you are, uh, you know, educate, when you are getting educated. You know, what kind of image that we would actually build about European society? Now, what will, etc. is, what conscience is, we will come back to it at some other point in time, because it means completely different thing in the scheme of things that exist in the, the way European cultures understand it. I will take one more step further. It's not just about the reading text. Look at our common sense conversations today that exist, that we talk about, say, for example, things like liberal. Oh, you are a liberal man. Oh, you're very liberal, etc. And we use it very frequently and actually we keep pronouncing judgments about it. And we also have equivalent words for that in Canada. So I, I just highlight a simple conversation that happened between, say, one of the very important Canada writer called Masthe Venkatesh Iyengar and another linguist. And this, this man, Masthe Venkatesh Iyengar, you know, meets another uh, young linguist some 25 years back. And there, that linguist asks, sir, you have been editing this magazine. So can I call your uh, editorial uh, positions as some kind of liberal positions? And immediately Masti turns back and asks him, uh, what did you ask? So he suddenly translate that word liberal into Canada and say, Udharavadi Dhorane. No, he simply says, I know Udharavadi is translation of the liberal, but what do you want to know from what I have written? Now this conversation goes on where Masti was actually explaining a very peculiar problem. He is the one who is writing the editorial of the magazine. He knows what he was writing, but it was unclear what to say to this young linguist who is asking him that question because he did not understand what liberal is. 
though he knew the word he knew udara was the is the translation of this libra now this is at the second level now we can go on adding for example there are poets who have written the uh, there are there are kannada intellectuals who have written descriptions of their father now if you look at the description of the father my father was doing the good thing there is this bad thing etc when these images were built he's saying more or less my father looks like a feudal but if you take the description of what constitute feudal and then look at the description that these people offers to this father suddenly you would realize that his father's life has nothing to do with what could be sketched as something which is feudal now at one level we don't understand these texts on which we are heavily dependent for example when you are reading literature social science etc you have to read the text that balu has already mentioned you have to read derrida foucault you have to read poetry in english commonwealth poetry european you know languages etc where you end up actually you know encountering this will conscience grace god god liberal all these kind of all these kind of ideas the problems of ethics they they are they simply confronted with us second we are using these words in some kind of a third rate translations and then we wanted to talk about ourselves you know so that's why ha ah, this guy behaves like a feudal this guy is a liberal so somebody asked me this question yeah yes you do some examination evaluation in a liberal way so he gave an example what did he understand by saying that it is a liberal way he understood it by giving some two three marks extra so that he can pass you know that is what is liberalism gets reduced to and as a consequence what happens neither we get hold of what these texts are saying in terms of the example of the poetry that i just took out nor we understand what are we talking about our own question like what masti asked to this linguist but what should i answer you because i am not getting the question that you are asking me as is if if i have to say whether i am liberal or not i should know i should understand what liberal is i may know the translation of what liberal is but it is not sufficient enough for me because i don't get what it is same way the feudal same way the conscience for example there was another professor who met jacob when uh, jacob was visiting shimoga in kuwempu university jacob actually spoke about this idea of conscience how it is the voice of god with an individual within the christian uh, world and suddenly this man comes up with the bhagavad gita shloka and say this is what is conscience we say it as atma sakshi in kannada and if you carefully look at it if there is no way on this earth if you use conscience to understand that particular uh, shloka in bhagavad gita you can make sense of it so in that way now knowingly or unknowingly we are actually you know bundled with a range of ideas you know to understand our text understand ourselves which are actually derived from european culture in last 300 years they have become today common sense as a consequence you know these things have become common sense we don't know what are we talking about ourselves we neither have an understanding of what kind of things that we are reading from european texts ah it's wonderful because <laughs> but i i hope it's something more than that namely when we are agnanis we need gyan and it appears you're full of it but though we should now like to go further i think the time schedule requires that i hand the mic back to the moderator shrinivas shrinivas where is yeah 